Okay, it's 12.05. I think we should go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Elrig Philadelphia Science Webinar. My name is Lorena Kalal and I'm at GlaxoSmithKline in Collegeville, PA. I am your WebEx host. Just a couple of notes about the webinar. Participants are muted. So for questions at the end, we will be using the chat function. You can find the chat button at the bottom of the participants box. If you click on that chat button in the drop down menu, you will select send to all panelists. One of the panelists will be reading the questions to our speaker at the end. This session is being recorded for future viewing. With that, I'd like to hand it over to the chair of our Elrig Philadelphia chapter. Over to you, Rodney. Thank you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, welcome to uh, Elrig's Philadelphia chapter's second virtual scientific meeting. These scientific meetings are opportunities for scientists to share their research and innovations with the global Elrig community. All our events are free to attend and open to all. <clears throat> our next event following today's will be on January 20th. And uh, you can register for that now on Eventbrite. The easiest way to get there is just go to lrig.org and you'll see on the home page a place where there's a free registration link. So we encourage you to register in advance and the Sunday before I'll send you a reminder so you just remember that you signed up that far in advance. If you are interested in presenting in a future meeting, or if you're interested in organizing a future meeting, please email your proposal to talks.phl at lrig.org. Uh, that will go to our committee and we will get back to you in terms of um, the, any uh, further details. I'd like to offer some special thanks to our committee. Lorena, who you mentioned, who's our host today. Ron, uh, who is also on our committee and is very helpful. And Sharon, who will be introducing our speaker uh, now. So I'll hand it off to Sharon uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. So that's incredible that we are here again for our second virtual scientific talk. As Rodney mentioned, my name is Sharon. I am an analytical automation specialist at GSK. So let me welcome and introduce Michael. For the past decade, Michael has been working as a research scientist at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition within the US Food and Drug Administration. His research of FDA concentrates on developing in vitro methods for detecting and predicting the safety of chemicals related to foods and dietary supplements. Additionally, he has served as FDA's representative on the essay evaluation team for Tox 21, a consortium among several federal agencies who are employing high throughput screening essays for toxicology testing. Michael received his PhD in chemistry from Penn State University, where he developed microfluidic devices for cellular assays. Please, Michael, go ahead and I start your presentation. Okay, thanks so much, Sharon. I wanna thank uh, the members of LRIG Philadelphia's uh, planning committee for allowing me to speak today. And I wanna thank all of you attendees who are tuning in during your lunch hour. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about uh, applying biological target-based assays uh, for chemical detection methods. So this is probably a review to most people, but I'm gonna go over it anyway, because um, I'm not quite sure uh, who in the audience uh, is in this field, but basically what are biological targets? Um, these are mostly proteins and cells that are responsible for maintaining proper cellular function. So you think about um, these are the main, these are probably the most common ones, these four, although there, there are others. Um, first we have enzymes, which catalyze chemical reactions, uh, receptors, uh, which um, can relay signals um, throughout the cell to, uh, through, um, through secondary messaging. Uh, ion channels, these are really important in the heart and the nervous system, uh, which may maintain, maintain potentials across the cellular membrane. And finally, transporters, uh, 
very important things like the blood-brain barrier, kidney, um, liver, and intestine, which transport uh, chemicals either into or out of the cell. So these are the main biological targets that, uh, um, that are important uh, for today. Now, um, when exogenous chemicals interact with these targets, we're, talk we're talking about things like toxins, drugs, uh, chemicals and botanicals, environmental pollutants. Uh, when all these bind to targets, it can either activate or block the function of the target, which can in turn lead to changes in cellular or physiological function. And sometimes this is a, this is a pharmacological mechanism in terms of a drug, but it can also be toxicological. There's a lot of uh, natural toxins out there, phytochemicals and pollutants that can act on these pathways and cause uh, 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 um, uh, negative effects as well. So it's important to be able to study these interactions. So when you think about with biological target-based assays and we're trying to identify these, um, these interactions between chemicals and their targets, what are these mainly used for? So the two main ones that I'm sure most of you know, already know about are discovery and the safety. So we're talking about discovery, drug discovery, but also food additive discovery and uh, pesticides as well. So it's not just limited to drugs, but high throughput screening and, and drug discovery, I mean, in discovery used for other substances as well, other, other than drugs. Um, and it's also used for safety because um, when you think about secondary pharmacology assays, we're trying to identify how um, the interactions of chemicals with targets can lead to adverse effects. Now, with this being said, these are kind of the quote unquote common ways, but another method that, another kind of method that's being used now with biological targets is for detection. So more of an analytical method. So the idea here is we can use a biological target and um, look at binding in order to detect a whole group of chemicals that may share binding to this common target. And this is gonna be really important for a lot of the applications I'm gonna to show today. And I'm gonna show why these are kind of advantageous. So what, why, what, you know, you know, when we think about it, why are these biological target assays important for chemical detection? So there's a few key reasons why. Um, first of all, in the environment and foods, a lot of times we have adulterants and contaminants that aren't single compounds, but are entire classes that we're concerned about. Um, and these, but in a lot of cases, these combine to a single target, which makes a target-based assay a good way of screening and identifying these potential contaminants and adulterants. Um, Another reason is um, these classes often contain um, chemicals having fairly diverse structures. Sometimes they're structural analogs, but a lot of times they're functional analogs, meaning they all bind to the same target, but they may or may not have the same uh, structural scaffolding. So with biological target-based assays, we can actually detect um, a wider range of structures. Another problem we often encounter is that sometimes we're facing novel and unpredictable compounds in a class. Um, I'm gonna show a specific example of this later when I talk about an application we developed. Um, and with the biological target-based assay offers another way to identify these potential new or unpredictable compounds. And lastly, the main function of these biological target-based assays for detection is to serve as rapid and inexpensive screening methods. So they're not confirmatory methods. These are meant for kind of rapid screening and be used in a, a suite of different methods for detection. Um, so biological target assays have some advantages and kind of uh, distinctions versus other common screening methods. So when you think about amino assays, usually, usually when we have a contaminant or an adulterant in foods, dietary supplements, et cetera, um, usually amino assays are kind of the first thing you turn to because they can easily be, um, they're the fairly uh, e more easily um, 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 performed. You can even adapt them to like a lateral flow assay format, like on a dipstick. Um, now, the problem with amino assays is that some, it's, you're basing it on a strict uh, chemical structure identity, and a lot of times when we're, when we're concerned with a whole class of compounds, the structures can differ quite a bit. So amino assays won't always work in that case unless you have many, many different antibodies, which is kind of um, more, more tedious to do. And then mass spectrometry is probably the most common thing we use for identifying contaminants and adulterants. Um, but mass spectrometry is a little more expensive. It's not miniaturized. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated. So um, biological targets, however, offer some, some additional advantages. So when I talked before about the structural diversity, here's some examples showing the structural diversity in different classes of compounds that have been developed 
um, to be detected by biological target assays. So in the first row, we have erectile dysfunction drugs. These all inhibit phosphodiesterase, an enzyme, in the, in a, an enzyme responsible for their mechanism of action. So in this first column, we have Viagra. In the second column, this is called xanthoranthophil, and you can see that there's very little, um, very little chemical, um, um, chemical similarity between the two, but they both bind very strongly to PDE5 and inhibit the enzyme. Another one are dioxins. These are environmental pollutants that are found uh, in soil and milk, things like that. They're persistent organic pollutants. They don't break down very easily in the environment. Um, and all these uh, dioxins can bind to uh, an aryl hydrocarbon receptor activation assay, which is a means of detecting them. And lastly, uh, another example, we have sulfonamides. These are antibiotics that can appear in milk as veterinary drug residues. And um, sulfonamides, um, the way they kill the bacteria is by uh, inhibiting a, an enzyme in the bacteria. So here are two examples of two uh, relatively different structures of these uh, uh, antibiotics. So overall, when we look at these chemicals, we have sometimes we have a lot of structural diversity, and you know, but despite that, we can use biological targets to detect them successfully. Another advantage of, of these assays is detecting mixtures of compounds. So I just mentioned uh, dioxins, which are these organic pollutants. Dioxins rarely exist alone. They're usually in mixtures. Um, and with a biological target-based assay, we can actually detect, we can basically make one measurement that represents the uh, cumulative response of all of these dioxins together. Because these dioxins individually are usually at low levels. However, they're all contributing to the aryl hydrocarbon um, um, receptor binding. So with, by, by employing that as a biological target-based assay, we can get a cumulative response and more easily detect this class of compounds. Now, obviously, there are some limitations. These can't always be used for every chemical you're interested in. Um, one limitation you think about are compounds requiring bioactivation. So if you have maybe a food sample um, and it contains like a prodrug, um, it might not bind to the biological target unless it's transformed the body. So in that case, you could never, you couldn't, you might not be able to detect it as easily using a biological target-based assay. Uh, on the other hand, you can also have inactive metabolites. So if you think about, if you have a blood sample and you're looking for a specific drug, uh, and, and, and the metabolites are inactive against the target, that 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 target-based assay wouldn't work as well in that case either. Matrix interference is always an issue. Um, especially when you're dealing with like biological samples like blood or for you looking at um, dietary supplements and botanicals, they often have a whole mixture of different things that can easily um, um, interfere with the assay, sometimes spectroscopic interference, um, sometimes you have nonspecific binding, especially if they're at really high levels. So matrix interference also poses some challenges. And lastly, uh, again, these assays aren't really standalone methods. They're meant to be complementary screening methods that can kind of um, help identify new compounds and, and kind of incre improve the uh, efficiency for screening. So in terms of assay schemes, um, you, know, you can kind of break them down to two different methods. We have bio a lot of these methods are, are biochemical methods where we have the targets that are isolated and purified in suspension. But we also have some activity-based assays, which are cellular-based assays as well. And the most common way these are used are 96 well plates, just because it's the most easy format to use. Um, in terms of detection, these are probably um, the most common ways. Um, spectroscopic, like absorbance, fluorescence, luminescence. Also some radioactivity, if it's a receptor binding assay, a lot of times you can employ that in a competitive-based assay uh, and use liquid scintillation counting to detect the binding. Um, and lastly, electrochemical, it's fairly rare to see this. Um, I haven't really seen too many assays used in the real world that use electric, electrochemical-based detection, but it is an option. Uh, um, you know, in some cases, it could serve as a good option. So this is an important slide because it shows kind of some examples of these biological target assays used for chemical detection that aren't just being used for research, but are actually been accepted and recognized by either standards organizations or regulatory authorities. So these assays here have actually gone through quite a bit of validation in order to get to where they are 
and being used for routine testing. So um, in the upper left corner, um, we have a sodium channel binding assay, which detects um, the seafood toxins. The seafood toxins actually cause paralysis by binding to the sodium channel. And a uh, receptor binding assay has been used, is now being used to detect these uh, uh, seafood toxins. Another one is another seafood toxin called okadeg acid. And these uh, inhibit a protein called, uh, an enzyme called protein phosphatase. phosphatase. This is currently under review for, for regulatory and common use. Uh, I mentioned dioxins a few times. So dioxins, uh, on a, they bind to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So there's a cell-based activity assay um, that was actually accepted by EPA, used for screening in soil. And I believe in the European Union and Japan, um, it's been accepted for doing some screening in, in milk as well. And lastly, on the right side of the slide, um, these three chemicals, sulfonamides, beta-lactams, and tetracyclines, these are all antibiotics commonly used uh, in livestock. Um, and it's important to monitor their levels uh, in milk. So FDA and the NCIMS, the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shippers, have, um, have accepted a few biotarget assays for detecting these in milk shipments as a screening method. So, so the, you know, these biological target assays sometimes can go through quite a bit of validation, and, and there are several out there. There might be others as well. These are the ones that kind of came up um, that are most obvious. Um, so, so these assays can actually be used in a screening, uh, screening environment for, for everyday use. So that's the end of this kind of the first part of the talk where I just want to give a brief overview and kind of a general idea of what these target assays are. So now I'm going to talk about a specific application that I developed where we developed a biological target-based assay for detecting erectile, dysfunct erectile dysfunction drugs in uh, tainted dietary supplements. So before I talk about the assay, I want to talk briefly about um, kind of the public health issue and why, why it's important. So there, maybe in the past 15 years, there's been a lot of, a huge number of products, especially on the internet, that are being marketed for herbal and all natural sex enhancement. Um, and they're being marketed as being called quote unquote dietary supplements. Uh, the problem is that people taking these thinking, thinking that they're natural and herbal uh, are actually putting themselves at great risk because a lot of these are being uh, tainted and adulterated with erectile dysfunction drugs, which is illegal. You can't have drugs and dietary supplements. Um, and these drugs that are hidden in the products can cause serious adverse health effects, which makes them really dangerous. So um, some of the most common um, adverse effects with erectile dysfunction drugs are fainting, dizziness, and most importantly, a sudden loss in blood pressure, which can be life-threatening. So these pose a huge risk for, for consumers. Um, so FDA has taken a lot of regulatory action against these products, everything from public notifications all the way to criminal prosecutions. Now, you may, you may or may not be familiar with FDA, but and how FDA does a lot of these uh, enforcement activities, but things like seizures, injunctions, and criminal prosecution, these are pretty involved, and these are not really used on a routine basis. These are used for like the worst of the worst offenders. So, you know, I think this slide really tells us how important this issue is and how pervasive it is. It's not just in, in the U.S., it's actually a problem in Europe and Asia as well. And a lot of these products being sold on the internet, you know, are being imported. So this is basically a global issue, not just for FDA. So I want to talk a little bit about what these erectile function drugs are um, and show a little bit, talk a little bit about their structural diversity because, because they're so diverse in their structures, this makes them hard to, harder to detect, which is one of the reasons why we're developing a biotarget assay. So first on the left side, we have um, a picture of the structure of sildenafil, which is Viagra. So this is probably one of the most common ones we find in these products. It's off patent, so it's relatively e it's more easy to kind of obtain, and all the synthesis is publicly available. Uh, and and we're, we're not only seeing Viagra, but we're also seeing Tadalafil and Vardenafil, which are Cialis and Levitra, which are also um, common prescription drugs for erectile dysfunction. Now, it gets a little more complicated than this because we're seeing a lot of these structural analogs pop up. Um, so and there's at least 80 of them. I'm sure there's way more out there, but um, you know, at least 80 have, have been uh, uh, identified. So here we can see an example of a sildenafil analog where the 
uh, different functional groups I highlighted that are different between the sildenafil and its analog. And there's over 80 link over any there's over 80 analogs linked to sildenafil, tadalafil, and vardenafil. So that's a large number of compounds. And if that's not bad enough, we also have some compounds that are totally structurally unrelated, like this anther anthophil I mentioned earlier in the, today's talk. So you can see we have a huge structural diversity among these um, different erectile dysfunction drugs. But what they all have in common is they all bind to PD5 phosphodiesterase, which is their pharmacolo pharmacological mechanism of action. So we can actually exploit this in a biological target-based assay to help detect these um, adulterants in, 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 uh, in, in uh, now on sex enhancement products. So here's the assay scheme. It's a relatively simple assay involving fluorescence. So, um, so we're detecting them based upon, detecting, we're detecting these drugs based upon their inhibition of PD5. So in this assay scheme, we start off with TAMR, which is a rhodamine fluorescent dye, which is conjugated to cyclic GMP. So if you allow this reaction to occur over time with the enzyme, it converts it to the rhodamine bound to GMP. And also included in the, react also included in the incubation is zirconial chloride. So what happens is the zirconial chloride associates with the free phosphate in the GMP, and, that, and it also actually quenches the fluorescence of the tamara, the rhodamine fluorescent dye. So if you allow this reaction to occur over time, you'll see the fluorescence decrease. However, in the presence of a erectile dysfunction drug or analog, you'll see the fluorescence decrease at a much slower rate because the enzyme is being inhibited. And by looking at the slopes of these, the linear range, we can look at the, we can kind of give a quantitative measure of the PD5 activity and therefore the inhibition by the drug. So the first step in developing this assay was selecting a, a substrate. So uh, if you look at the substrate, you have the rhodamine, the CGMP, but in the middle there's actually a linker, a linker group um, and here we have three different substrates showing the different uh, linker groups. One, number one has the longest linker group, and number three is the shortest. So um, we tested these three different substrates to look at the enzyme kinetics, and we found that uh, using a common settings on the plate reader, substrate one actually had the best, um, the best kinetic profile and the highest Vmax. So we decided to choose substrate one um, for our assay. So looking at this reaction, um, because all these PD5 inhibitors are competitive inhibitors, we want to choose a we want to choose a substrate concentration that wasn't saturating the enzyme. So we went to, we went with the KM, which is the half the half saturating concentration, and we calculated calculated that to be five micromolar. So that's that's the uh, substrate concentration we chose uh, the, uh, for, to con conduct this assay. Uh, in the second step, we also wanted to, we also wanted to optimize the zirconial chloride concentration. So uh, we tested three different concentrations over a log range, and we found the 100 micromolar of zirconial chloride actually yielded the highest signal for activity. So we chose 100 micromolar as our final condition for the zirconial chloride. So now we established the assay. Um, we, we, started, uh, we started testing out some different drugs inhibitors. So we, we selected a structurally diverse group of nine representative PD5 inhibitors. So first we have Viagra, sildenafil, and then we chose these as uh, sildenafil analogs, and all of these are very commonly found in sex enhancement products as adulterants. Next, we chose tadalafil. You notice how the tadalafil, the structure, looks very, very dissimilar from the sildenafil, and tadalafil, I believe, is Cialis. And lastly, we chose vardenafil, um, Levitra, along with avanafil and xantharanthophil. So by testing a kind of a, a diverse group of compounds, we can have a better, um, you know, we can feel more comfortable that we're actually detecting uh, unknowns as well that might pop up. So we tested um, all nine of these compounds, uh, just standard solutions and buffer. So in the left side, left hand uh, graph, you can see the PD5 activity plotted against log of the drug concentration. And you can see for the three, for the first three um, drugs, they all had pretty good profiles. Uh, they all followed standard concentration response for an enzyme inhibition. All fit well to the hill curve. <clears throat> and 
and these values also uh, match up pretty well with literature values as well. So we did this for all, um, all nine of these compounds. So you can see here the, the IC50 values, which are the concentrations that inhibit activity by 50%, which gives you an overall sense of the potency of the compound. <clears throat> so you can see that the xanthoranthophil was the most potent inhibitor, around 0 0.4, 0 0.4 nanograms per milliliter, and avanafil was the weakest inhibitor, around 4 nanograms per milliliter. So you can see there's about a tenfold range among these uh, among these representative compounds that we chose. So <clears throat> remember, our goal here is to detect the is to, to detect these drugs and products as an analytical method. Now you can see there might be a problem if you're trying to do this in a quantitative way because each of these drugs, if used as a standard solution, will give you a different result because each drug kind of binds uh, to a different affinity. And if we're posed, if we're being challenged with an unknown sample, we're not going to know ahead of time which one of these is in there. So instead of um, validating this as a strict quantitative assay, we decided to do it as a qualitative-based assay, and I'll show how that works in a second. <clears throat> so the idea is we're going to have a sample, measure the PD5 activity, we're going to have a threshold value, and we're going to compare it, see if it's above or below the threshold value. And that's going to tell us if it's likely to, to be adulterated or not. So the first step, before we, t before we start spiking, doing spiking experiments with these different drugs, we have to um, test the matrix blanks. So we obtained about 25 different herbal dietary supplements among eight manufacturers. These are very reputable manufacturers, not ones like on the internet. And we use both tablets and capsules. And here's some examples of the ingredients that are found in those um, products. So a lot of these are actually very frequently associated with erectile dysfunction and sex enhancement products, which is why we chose them here. And there's many more ingredients as well, but these are the ones I kind of just wanted to briefly mention. So, we, you know, we have a, a huge, uh, we, you know, and not only do we have, um, uh, not only do we have botanical ingredients here, but we also have some non-ones like an amino acid, like L-arginine. So using these matrix blanks, we are able to start validating our assay. So in this graph here, we have our, our sample with our drug concentration in milligrams per gram. At the bottom, we have our measured PD5 activity from zero to 125%. So we, we tested all 25 of those matrix blanks, and here's the distribution of those samples. So this is a box and whisker plot. The whiskers represent the maximum and minimum values. The box represents the quartiles, and the, the, uh, the line in the middle is the median. So we test these matrix blanks. We measured the PD5 activity. And the average PD5 activity is around 97%. So there's very little inhibition of the PD5 activity. And this is uh, what we'd expect because these are unadulterated. These are clean herbal products. So um, the next step, remember I mentioned how we wanted to develop this as a qualitative assay. So what we want to do is we wanted to define a threshold value. So we went three standard deviations below the mean, median. Uh, and call this activity, which is 86%, our threshold value. So now what we're going to do is in the future, when we're measuring a sample, any sample that falls below the threshold, we're going to classify as being adulterated, and anything above the threshold is going to be unadulterated. So it's a binary qualitative assay. So now we have our threshold established. The next step is we want to figure out our false um, positive rate. So if you notice with these matrix blanks, none of them crossed over below the threshold. So we had no false negatives, which is good because a false negative would trigger maybe additional screening or give you, you know, a false result, which is not what we're looking for. So we have no false positives. So next we want to be, we, we, next we, we took these samples and spiked them with all nine drugs at different levels. And we wanted to figure out what our false negative rate was. So here's the first set of compounds. They're in, they're, in, they're in no particular order. So we took each drug and we spiked it at two different um, concentrations to make sure we're getting a shift, um, like a dose response. So you can see for these first uh, group of compounds, around 0.5, 1, or 2 um, milligrams per gram, all of the uh, PD5 activity fell below the threshold, so we have no false negatives, as expected. 
So we continue doing these spiking experiments. And I forgot to mention each of these boxes represents the distribution of 20 samples. Now, when we got to the next group here, you can see here Avanafil um, at one milligram per gram actually produced a false negative. And so we have one out of 20 samples that were false negatives or 5%. Now, there's a lot of um, guidance out there on developing these screening assays. Um, and in general, you, always need, you have to be able to tolerate some false negatives. It can't be perfect. And for the most part, 5% is usually uh, a level that people are willing to tolerate. So what we can do is we can, use, we can look at our, now we can calculate our detect detection capability. This is lowest concentration that yields 5% false negative rate. So in this case, the concentration yielding the lowest false negative rate is one milligram per gram. So this is our detection capability assay. So a sample that falls you know, in this region on, on, uh, above the threshold would be above one milligram per gram and anything below uh, is gonna be above, sorry, anything, any sample that tests in the adulterated region we're saying is below the limit of detection, which is one milligram per gram. Anything below the threshold is considered adulterated above one milligram per gram. Now, if we, um, because these, these, because these uh, products are often in capsules and tablets, we can convert this to assuming a very small or very large tablet capsule. This converts to around 0.3 to one milligram per gram. And more importantly, um, usually when we encounter these adulterated products in real life, they contain drug levels at at least 10 milligrams per gram upwards of 100, um, which, which is another reason why they're so dangerous because a common Viagra dosage, I believe, is around 25 milligrams or 50. So if we're seeing upwards of over 100, that's at least twice the normal dose, and people might be taking this, these over and over again or, or on a, you know, an everyday use, that, that's what makes these really dangerous. So, so um, the important thing here is that the detection capability of one milligram per gram is actually at least 10 times lower than what we, find, what, than what we normally encounter. So the odds of finding a sample that might lie right at the, right at the uh, interface of, of the threshold value is not very high. So most likely, you know, in this case, our limited detection is actually fit for use. Now, um, after going through all this, you notice that each time we're only testing one drug in spike samples. Now, in real life, we often encounter um, mixtures of these drugs in these products. So we also want to test out mixtures. So here's the same type of graph again. On the side, we have different mixtures of drugs. Um, and the, each, the total concentration of each, each mixture is one milligram per gram. And we change the ratios. So you can see in each one of these cases, uh, they were all, um, they all inhibited the PD5 activity and they were all correctly classified as adulterated at a total concentration of one milligram per gram. So again, we have no false positives in this scenario as well. So not only is this assay good for detecting single compounds, but we can also detect mixtures as well. So um, right now in the USP, a recent chapter came out for screening um, sex enhancement products for drug adulteration. And this chapter can use a whole bunch of different methods, one of which is a PD-5 inhibition method. And it really, it's a Promega um, manufactured luminescence-based kit. So I wanted to kind of like show some similarities and differences between the developed assay here and the Promega kit that's already in the USP um, and show some advantages of this method. So in terms of analysis time, uh, the method developed here uh, basically, we can analyze a sample in only 15 minutes, whereas the luminescence-based assay, the Promega kit, takes about 70 minutes. The sample prep in both cases is the same for dissolving in DMSO, making dilutions, and also centrifugation as well. A detection method, and with this assay here, it was a kinetic method using fluorescence detection. And like I said, the current method in the USP for PD-5 inhibition is luminescence endpoint. The cost is significantly different. Um, for this method, it's only about 25 cents a well, whereas for the USP luminescence kit, it's about 10, a little bit over 10 times higher. In terms of the simplicity, uh, you know, in this assay, it's basically one step. We're just adding everything sequentially into one incubation, whereas with the luminescence-based kit, it involves a, a series of kind of conjugated reactions involving 
luciferase and protein kinase and all these different reactions. And there's three different steps, and we're, we're adding them at different times. So it's a little bit more, um, a little bit, a little bit more involved to, to, to uh, conduct the luminescence assay. Uh, developed assay here is one reaction, whereas the USP luminescence assay is three. All the components in this assay here are well known and well characterized, whereas in the Promega kit, they're all proprietary. So we believe that the developed assay here has some has some advantages, and um, I'm in touch with some at USP who in the future could um, incorporate my method into the USP as well, which would be a, a really good accomplishment, I think. So I would wait until that, that cycle comes up. So in conclusion, um, biological target-based assays, we can get a, using these biological tar target-based assays, we can detect classes of chemicals based upon their common ability to bind to a biological target. And a key advantage of this is to be able to detect compounds without really knowing too much about their molecular structure ahead of time if we're looking for something in a, in a, in a class we already know about. These methods are ideal for screening, um, where they serve as complementary methods but not confirmatory methods. And um, it's important to know that several biological target-based assays have been recognized and accepted by their standards organizations or regulatory authorities. And these are commonly being used in the real world. So I just want to acknowledge some people that worked on this project. Uh, I want to acknowledge Sumidu Mappa, who, was, uh, did it, who performed some of those spiking experiments, and also acknowledge some of the management at FDA who, who uh, approved the project. And uh, so lastly, I'd like to thank all the attendees that I came to dialed in today. I'd like to thank, again, Elric Philadelphia for hosting my talk. And now I can uh, entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, do you have the next slide? Yes. Just to yep. remind people who may have dialed in, uh, please, if you would like to ask some questions, since you're muted, please go to the chat box and send your question to all panelists, and Sharon will read your questions for you. So thank you again, Michael. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Great presentation, definitely. Thank so, you. first question, how are samples obtained for testing? Okay, so when we did our testing, so we we basically, we, we bought a bunch of matrix blanks um, from, the, from the store, actually, and these were reputable companies that were uh, participating in USP-sanctioned um, uh, good manufacturing practice programs, so we had a really good um, uh, feeling that these were unadulterated. Now, for the other samples that we did, we spiked them. So we obtained the, the for those we obtained the drugs. They were just standard drugs, and we spiked them into the the matrix blanks that we obtained through the store. I have a question myself. Um, okay. Have you tested adulterate samples? Yeah, actually, we we weren't able to do that. Um, yeah, we, we didn't have uh, access to any of those, actually, unfortunately. FDA is a pretty big organization, and the actual field testing is handled by different groups. So we didn't actually obtain any real-life samples. But I think, um, you know, this is kind of a starting point. And in the future, if we decide to take this to a next step of more of a multi-lab validation, I think maybe um, we'll actually look at real adulterate samples to see how this would behave uh, in a more real-world setting instead of relying on spike samples. So next question, this looks like a huge savings in both time and cost of essay. What is the chance that this will become a USP protocol? Um, like I mentioned, so after this was kind of published, um, someone from at USP contacted me, a scientific liaison, and we got talking and um, he seems pretty interested in maybe like, um, you know, incorporating this into the USP general chapter. So with the wait and see, I haven't been in touch recently, but um, I think the, the revisions are done on a, on a kind of a cycle, cyclical basis. So I think in the future, we're gonna reconnect and see if uh, see what we decide to do, if this will be actually be incorporated or not. Okay, I see. Any other questions? I see another one. Uh, what would be the next step if a marketed product is positive in your essay? 
So if this tested positive in the assay, I believe they would probably follow up with um, probably LCMS, like tandem mass spec, um, just maybe as a confirmatory method. And if the LCMS, if the tandem LCMS didn't yield anything, um, I think what they would do is maybe use a high resolution mass spec method and start digging in to see if um, the, the substance is like a brand new or novel substance. You know, that's one of the benefits of screening with this assay is because you can discover those substances before knowing what their true chemical structure identity is. Um, so I think, you know, the follow-up would be first tandem mass spec, and then if that doesn't work, then maybe uh, use like a high resolution mass spec and look for an unknown. Okay, I see. So who will be the, uh, who will be, I guess, the department in the FD, FDA doing this kind of testing? Uh, so FDA, so um, FDA has different centers. So you probably heard of CEDAR, CBER. Um, there's one called Office of Regulatory Affairs. So these are like the field labs. So these are the people that don't really do research, but they do more routine testing, um, and they're monitoring the market. So um, usually these are these field labs, which are throughout the country, um, are the ones that do the routine testing. Um, they also work with customs service. So the customs because a lot of these products are actually being imported, um, sometimes customs might flag them as potentially problematic, um, or maybe they're not labeled correctly, or um, they're on a list of prohibited products, and then FDA might get samples from them as well in the field labs and do the testing. So in the future, it's possible this asset could be incorporated into this huge you know, testing scheme um, uh, you know, after it maybe goes through uh, more validation, through like a multi-lab validation with more samples. Excellent. Um, any other questions? Um, I can okay. see some more yeah. on the chat. There was another one around, um, it looks like a huge savings in both time and cost. What is the chance that this will become a USP protocol? Right, right. So, um, right, so I'm in, I'm in contact with a scientific liaison at USP, so he was really interested in this assay as possibly uh, maybe to um, use along with the existing luminescence one that's already in the USP or maybe, um, you know, be cited in the USP. So I think, you know, when these chapters get revised on a on a uh, certain schedule, we might talk again and figure out if this will be actually be implemented or not. Great. Um, there is another one that was sent to me. Um, they thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Has this approach been attempted for the detection of aflatoxins at this point? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm not sure if aflatoxin, aflatoxins, so aflatoxins, if you don't know, these are um, toxins I believe are found in grain, grains, and they're from a, a fungus. Um, I'm not sure if these aflatoxins have a specific shared biological target. I know they cause uh, liver damage. I'm not sure if they have a specific target or not. Um, I, I do know that right now for screening for aflatoxins, they do have uh, a lot of uh, uh, amino assays that recognize them that are used for screening. But in terms of biological target assay, I don't know. That's something I'd have to look into because I'm not sure what exactly their target is or, or if they even have a shared target. Let's see, one more. Have you seen any matters or samples that interfere in the assay and make it impossible to determine if there is a specific on the enzyme? Oh, that's a good question. So um, initially when we started developing the assay, uh, we were kind of using just the crude um, uh, extracts of the botanicals that were spiked. And when we tested those as matrix, well, when we tested the botanicals as matrix blanks, we did see some interference um, because those botanicals were so, they were so concentrated and they have, they're mixtures of so many different things. Um, so what happened was throughout the assay, we started doing higher dilutions and finally we, we um, reached a dilution point where um, we no longer saw any of the matrix interference. So, and, and, and at the same point, at the same time, that dilution didn't, you know, we were trying to basically balance the dilution uh, dilution factor with our, our limit of detection, which is one milligram per gram. So obviously if you keep diluting down, your limit of detection is gonna, it's not gonna be as good. So we kind of found a sweet spot, which is one milligram per gram. So the dilution factor corresponding 
um, is what we use, and that, that kind of took away a lot of the matrix interference. Let's see. Uh, we have another question. Will this work with opiate receptors? Uh, that's a great question. So there, there's been some research already um, in this area. Um, so there, I think, I forgot who it is, someone, someone in Europe, someone in the European Union actually is using a uh, uh, opioid receptor activity assay, a cell-based assay, and they actually screen for opioids in blood samples and urine, I believe, and it seemed to work pretty well. So I don't know if, I don't know if he's deciding to, you know, try to get it validated more because for, for those of you who don't know about op opioids, um, a lot of these newer, you know, we have opioids like morphine and the classical ones, but a lot of these newer ones that are coming out are synthetic and they're very diverse in their structures, which is another reason why these, these, this uh, biological target-based assay for opioids would be really useful. So um, there is some, yeah, there is some research out there on the opioid, opioids as well, as well as cannabinoids, because that they suffer from the same problem. A lot of these synthetic cannabinoids now have really diverse structures that are popping up. And um, you know, a lot of these clinical immunoassays can sometimes miss some of them. So I think in those cases, these, these biological target assays might, might serve a really good purpose for screening them and improving the, uh, the assay uh, performance. Okay, great, thank you. Good, I don't see more questions right now. Um, there is, I'll jump in and ask the one more is, what happens when a marketed product does test positive? You had mentioned some of the remediation activities that they were involved in sort of legal. Is that happening or, and is it based on oh. the results from this test? Right, right. So, so in terms of the lab approach, so um, if this test were to be positive, you would follow up using, you know, tandem mass spec and maybe a high resolution mass spec if the tandem mass spec doesn't work. Now, in terms of the legal side of that, um, FDA, um, you know, the, the, they are testing a lot of these samples on a routine basis. And if they do come up positive, usually they will, um, on, their, on the FDA's website, there's a whole list of products that they, that they mention and they put a public notification out alerting the public. Uh, sometimes there can be recalls as well, I believe, from the company. If the company um, knows that they might have some sort of contamination issue, they can choose to recall. Um, and then you have those really, really, um, uh, those really severe kind of uh, uh, responses that are, that are maybe meant for more of the um, people that are doing this over and over again, uh, the repeat offenders, if, if, if you will. Um, so those are more like criminal prosecutions and you know, seizing the products and uh, things like that. So there's a lot, there's a whole, there's a whole spectrum of different responses FDA is taking, depending on the severity and the manpower and the, the unique situation being posed by that specific case. So I think we're very close to the end of the talk. So thank you, Michael. It's for all this information is great and, and I'm, going to ask Rodney uh, to conclude. Thank you. Thank okay, you thank for you joining us today. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed your presentation. So thanks to everybody who attended today. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, our next presentation is on January 20th. You can see the uh, link to sign to register on lriga.org. It will be through Eventbrite. And I will send you a notification if you register the Sunday before to remind you. Uh, if you're interested in presenting or in organizing a future present, just send us a, pre a proposal to talks.phl at lrig.org. Uh, thanks to Lorena and Sharon and Ron, and a uh, special thank you to Michael today for an excellent presentation. Thank you for your attendance. You all have a nice day. Take care. Signing off. Thank you.